I'm a faculty member in the Department of Black Studies. And um, I, Peace Studies has been having these um, speakers, the speaker series um, for quite some time now. And um, this year is no exception. And I was happy to have Angela agree to, to come. And it took us some time to actually get them to be here. Um, and so I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that we're still in the throes of a pandemic. Uh, and so I really, we really appreciate you, know, you being here in person. Uh, let me do a little formal introduction um, for Angela, who has a very provocative topic. And I like the project, especially because it kind of integrates Black studies with history and a bit of um, cultural studies, especially the, where the issue of shamanism, or as we say in the Caribbean, obeism, and um, the conjuring business are concerned. So um, Angela Zimmerman is presently a professor of history at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Um, they began, the, it seems, the academic um, teaching career in 1997 at San Diego State University. And uh, um, that was followed by a, a fellowship, a Mellon Fellowship in History at uh, Columbia University. Angela's PhD is from the University of California in San Diego. And uh, they did in, and, uh, that dreaded MPhil. I think, I don't know if, 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 <laughs> if, if this crowd is familiar with the MPhil. I know you're familiar with the MA. But the MPhil, um, for those of us who are, who are kind of used to the, the British system, um, was done at uh, Cambridge University at Darwin College. And Angela did some additional studies in Germany, in Berlin, at Humboldt University and at the University of uh, Vienna. There has been a number of prizes and honors, which I'm not surprised about, including the Robert W. Kennedy Prize for Excellence in Teaching. And I see several teaching awards, which is um, testament to um, Angela's um, teaching um, capabilities. There is also the, the Bender Teaching Award from George Washington University that was conferred back in 2003. They have been the recipient of a number of external grants and fellowships as well, including the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, the Visiting Fellow, um, and, and the one, one that really jumped out at me, I, I, I'm trying to get very personal, was, was the one for at, 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 University, at Warwick in 2017. So we might have crossed paths has it not been for the Grand March of Time. So, so you came when I had already left Warwick, but uh, I, you know that, that kind of um, experience, I know what it was, I really do. So the, <laughs> yeah, I will not mention that I was, uh, you know, uh, yes, I enjoyed myself. <laughs> it, 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 it was the West Midlands after all. And I always say it's kind of funny that I ended up teaching in the, middle, in the West Midwest in the United States after going to school in the West Midlands of England. Uh, Angela, has, and Angela has published uh, quite a bit over the years. Um, they have edited a book um, by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels called The um, Civil War in the United States and the monographs, Anthropology and Anti-Humanism in Imperial Germany came out in 2001. And um, the one you hear a lot about, Alabama in Africa. Imagine that, Booker T. Washington, the German empire and the globalization of the new South um, that came out first in 2010. 10 through the Princeton University Press. Angela's most, um, Angela's current, current uh, in, um, research is entitled uh, A Very Dangerous Element. This is a book that's in progress, how immigrant radicals and enslaved rebels transformed the civil war into a revolution against slavery and helped defeat the Confederacy. And that I think is what where this, this, this afternoon's talk is, is pulled from. 
it. I just want to mention one last thing that I thought was important for students to note that Angela is on the board of some very prestigious journals. So when you do get that, that degree, you might want to um, familiarize yourself with Angela before we leave. Um, or for those who are online, just shoot them an email. The, the, the journals, um, the past and present, past and present, okay. And uh, Angela is also on the advisory board of the history of the present and has published in that journal as well, and as well as the journal of the history of knowledge. And my all time favorite accomplishment is that Angela was a co-chair of the Black Diaspora Studies Network of the German Studies Association, which kind of brought to mind Christine and her interest in Blacks in Germany. So I think you have heard enough from me. And without further ado, please put your hands together. Welcome Angela Zimmerman. Okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Dave, and for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, thank you also to uh, Mary Dixon Amagata for everything, including just getting set up. But we've been in touch since I've been rearranging this this talk. And I want to thank also uh, Andy Hoberick, who first invited me to give this talk two years ago. Um, I was supposed to give it almost two years ago to the day. And uh, then this strange pandemic happened. I thought, oh, it's probably not gonna be able to happen. Let's try to reschedule it for next month, you know, April of 2019. And, um, you know, it's just interesting to think about that. And, and it's, I'm so happy to be, this is my first like IRL talk since then. And it's been, I think for, you know, for all of us really difficult two years and it's still, it's not, far from over, but it was really hard. And it's nice to be back with everybody. And this is, I'm so happy that this, this of all places is the place I get to come. And also just thank you all for coming out. And those of you on Zoom, thank you for bearing with hopefully not too many more Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings, but soon, soon. But it's also, I'm glad you're, everyone's here. Thank you so much. Um, so this is a talk about the Civil War and it's drawn from exactly as, as Dave said, from my, from my, my book, a book project. Um, it's really centered in Missouri, so it's extra special to be in Missouri presenting on it. I don't have to explain. There's this place called Missouri. Here is here it is on the map, and I bet most people even know where Boonville is, which is usually, you know, that's super esoteric. Um, I'm also conscious of the fact that I'm presenting on, you know, a war for a peace studies program, and I'm really, you know, both because it's peace studies and it's war, but also because it's a lot of different disciplines. I'm excited to talk to you about that and to hear your feedback and, you know, ask grateful in advance for the fact that sometimes, you know, every discipline does things different. And sometimes, you know, historians can be too much detail about one thing and not enough explanation of it. So I hope you'll ask about stuff. And I'm really excited to hear from all different, all different perspectives that you, that you have. So without further anything, ado or anything else, let me get started. Um, so I'm talking about conjure and then the kind of the general overall like big picture perspective on like my take on the civil war is the self-emancipation thesis, which is basically, you know, the, to the question of how did slavery end in the United States? One answer is, you know, to caricature it somewhat because I don't agree with it. It's like Lincoln, the great emancipator, um, you know, freed enslaved people. And the other um, is, you know, known most commonly is that the self-emancipation thesis that pointing out, which I think is, not something I want to focus on too much today, but it's controversial, I think, but shouldn't be that Lincoln and the Union did not want to free enslave people. They were accused by that of the Confederacy, and they did a very good job of defending themselves against that false accusation, um, both in words and in deeds through most of the war. And I don't want to go into that, it'd be a whole separate talk, but then, and, um, but the self-emancipation thesis says enslaved people use the chaos of the war to 
free them free themselves. And this has been a, you know, I think enslaved people themselves knew this. And we'll talk about some of the, you know, that they were freeing themselves and it wasn't always, it wasn't Lincoln. Um, but one of the first great academic formulations of it is in Du Bois's great book, Black Reconstruction from 1935. And in that book, uh, du Bois identifies what he calls a general strike of enslaved plantation workers against slavery that forced the Union to recognize their de facto freedom, helped overthrow the Confederacy, and was then undone after the Confederacy was defeated by what he calls a counter-revolution of property. And I think that's essential. I mean, I have a lot of a lot of commentary on that, and a lot of what I'm doing is commentary on that. But I think one thing that's really interesting about the self-emancipation thesis, both in Du Bois's book in Black Reconstruction, but even more in the way it's been used and I think sometimes misused to sort of like undo the radicalness of that challenge is to make it what I might call, you might call a contributionist understanding that it's self-emancipation, it's a rebellion against US slavery, but then it's presented as a contribution to US history. And you can even see that, maybe you can't see it from here, but in the subtitle of Du Bois's book, which is, um, an essay toward a history of the part which black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880. Um, yeah, I mean, that's true in so far as we have something like democracy, um, black people in both the civil war and subsequently paid a very big role in creating that. But I think what's important to recognize and what I wanna emphasize is that that was done for a variety of reasons, but certainly in the civil war, it was not a contribution to official US history, but a rebellion against official US history. So a couple people that I take, you know, inspiration from actors at the time. One is Frederick Douglass, who is often presented as, you know, was as, you know, including in like David Blight's recent biography, as very much as a contributionist to, to, US, to US history. But a quote that's I rarely see it quoted, but I think it's really important from my, my perspective, is this quote from the first month of the war. Um, when the question of black military service comes up and Douglas says, yeah, we should form units. Um, we should arm ourselves and train. But then he says, if we fight, we must fight against the North as well as the South, Abraham Lincoln, as well as Jefferson Davis, because as he points out correctly, both were talking about preserving slavery, Jefferson Davis more aggressively, um, but, but both. But someone I'm more interested in, directly relevant to who we're talking, what we're talking about today is less famous, but Super interesting. Lucy Broadus, who was a woman who'd been enslaved, um, grew, born in slavery, um, interviewed in 1935 as part of the Works Progress Administration interviews. Um, and this is what she's, she's talking about conjurers and contrasting them with, uh, with, um, with, with, with Lincoln and giving another version of the, uh, of the self emancipation thesis. And I'll talk a lot about conjure, but just to give just enough to just get started. Conjure is one of a variety of Afro-Atlantic religions or Af something called Afro-Atlantic social healing traditions um, that uh, you know, varied both across North America and also across the Americas. But if it was in um, Jamaica, it would be called in other, I think other places in the Caribbean, Obia or Vodou or Voodoo in, in Haiti. Candomblé in Brazil, Santeria in Cuba, and there's many varieties of it, and conjures the North American variety, variety of it. And it's sometimes it's called hoodoo also. Um, so here, heady persons are another word for people who are conjurers, conjuration, just conjure. And this is what Lucy Brada says. So, them heady persons sure could do that conjurations. It was them, the conjurers she means, that freed the slaves. They give a hand to Lincoln and them other big emancipator men so they could bring it about a gift from the colored people of conjuration and power. And first of all, I just love the snark of Lincoln and them big emancipator men that she says there. And um, you know, one bit of background here is that Lucy Broadus was, her mother was pregnant with her during this very brief period in Missouri when the first commander, John Fremont, issued an, an emancipation proclamation and declared everybody held as a slave by a secessionist, but really basically everybody as free. And then by the time Luce Broadus was born, Lincoln had countermanded that proclamation. And so she was in fact born into slavery precisely because of Lincoln and the mother. I don't know if she knew that narrow chronology or not, but it certainly rings true. And there's something, an interesting tension here um, in that in the quote, on the one hand, she's saying, 
it was the conjurers, it was them, the conjurers that freed the slaves. And then the next sentence, it's like, they gave a hand to Lincoln. So is there, are they helping or are they just, or are they helping lending a hand or are they doing it themselves? And it's actually, if you know a little bit about Conjure, as you will soon, you can see what she's saying. She's talking not about giving a hand in a sense of helping, but creating a Conjure hand, which was one of the main objects of, of Conjure um, that was creating, it's a specially created, um, it's often in a cloth bag, often in a red cloth bag. Um, and it's a specially composed um, uh, object for um, dealing with specific social problems. It could be things that would, that, you know, that, that, you know, an MD today would recognize as an illness. It could also be things like matters of the heart, love, whether you love someone and want them to love you back or want them to stop loving someone else. A lot of love stuff, political stuff, um, overthrowing slavery was something that conjurers like people in, in um, you know, in, in other Afro-Atlantic killing traditions were parts of rebellions against slavery. Um, and it could be also surviving slavery too. So it was medicine, but it was more, it was more than that too. And that's what a hand meant. I think that's what Lucy Broadus is talking about when she's talking about um, giving, uh, giving, a, uh, giving a hand to Lincoln and the mother big emancipator meant. Um, it's interesting because there's not a lot about conjurers in, uh, in there's some, but there's not a ton about conjurers in uh, rebellions by enslaved people in the United States, North America, but you know, the, the role of, 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 um, of voodoo in the Haitian revolution is well established. Um, the role of Obia in uh, Jamaican anti-slavery fights was also established and in other places too. So it's not that surprising in comparative context that conjurers would also be involved, but it's just not that talked about and certainly not in, um, in, in, Civil, War, in Civil War history. Um, you may have, if you know, if you've, most conjurers were on, were widely, wide, there were on, I don't know if most plantation, every plantation, but most plantations, many enslaved people talk about the importance of conjurers. Maybe one, if you've read Frederick Douglass's autobiographies, he talks about Sandy Jenkins, a conjurer that gave him a hand that helped him win a fight that began, he said, his struggle against slavery, first for his own emancipation, first for his own, you know, ability to fight and then emancipation and then to become like maybe the greatest anti-slavery activist of, of the 19th century in the US. Um, and yet he also, and this is very typical too, disavows Con, disavows Jenkins and says, well, Jenkins' hand did work, but of course I don't believe in that. And there is something that I think for published free African-American intellectuals in the North, a little bit embarrassing about conjure. It seems like, you know, it's superstitious, it's, you know, quote unquote primitive. And it was certainly used by that as white authors. And I'm conscious of, you know, my own, whatever the position there and definitely wanted to do the opposite of that and really seeing conjure as something, um, you know, as modern, as efficacious. It's something that, I mean, I don't know if this matters or not, but something I certainly respect a great deal and, you know, whatever, like I would definitely discourage people from just ordering it online and just like fucking around with it because it's definitely not, I, yeah, um, and, uh, but it's not that it's bad. It's just like, it's, if you, it's real. It's like, if you get into this, you, you got to get into this. You, it's, it's not, it's not something, but anyway, so enough. Um, the, uh, yeah, but the conjurers, the way I see it, if you, if the term organic intellectuals is something you use, I would say conjurers are the organic intellectuals of enslaved people. When enslaved people are talking about who was important to them, who was the political leader, who was the smartest person around, um, it was the conjurer. Who do you go to for advice? Who do you go for treatment? Um, and, um, and they were widely respected, not that it mattered so much, but white people also respected them for healing and as charismatic authoritative figures. The conjurer Lucy Broadus was talking about specifically, I mean, here she's talking about lots of conjurers, but in that interview, it's someone I'm going to talk about today named Guinea Sam Nightingale, who was a famous conjurer in Boonville. When he died in the 1880s, there was actually an obituary in a New Orleans African-American newspaper. That's how wide, widely known he was. Um, not so well remembered today, of course, um, but there is the University of Missouri Press published a children's book of his biography under the the series Famous Famous um, Missourians, which I think is totally right on and is very, you know, he should, be, he should be remembered as a famous Missourian even, even more. And what I want to do today is talk about, tell the civil story of the Civil War, 
through the biography of, or a story of the Civil War, through the biography of Guinea Sam Nightingale, and tell the biography of Guinea Sam Nightingale through a story of the Civil War, and think about how those things work, work together. Um, so let me talk about, first thing, two journeys of Guinea Sam Nightingale, trans and cis national histories. Probably some of you know this already, but the first time the, before trans and cis became used as markers for gender, um, being, you know, crossing a gender line or on this side of a gender line, they were used as geographical boundaries too. So there's, I don't know how to say that word, trans Lithuanian Austria, and anyway, that's too complicated, but like Thomas Jefferson talked about transatlantic, um, which is like Europe, he meant, and cisatlantic, meaning the US, so that those boundaries, but you know, obviously for me, these things have, have, uh, have, have other resonance too and fun to talk about. Um, so there are two biographies and they both have some, a lot of things in common, but the, the thing that they both share is that um, Nightingale was born in Guinea in West Africa. And let me see if I can just show up. Guinea is um, right there, north of Sierra Leone. Um, and uh, around 1810, he was enslaved and brought to the US as part of a number, we don't know exactly how many because it was an illegal uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, and uh, ended up by the 18, by, around 1856, arrived in Boonville, Missouri, where he became a famous, as I said, a well-respected and influential conjurer um, until his death in 1880 something, 1880s, 1887. Um, the big difference in the two biographies are his journey, how he got to Boonville. The one that Lucy Broadus told, that other people told too, that was told, I think the earliest account I found was 1870, so when he was still alive, so I'm guessing that's when Guinea Sam told too, um, is that he was fired by cannon from West Africa, from Guinea, and landed directly in Boonville and said, I love this line, um, I'm a conjure man, and I'm telling you right now, I've come here to stay, and there's a new day coming for this town. And there was indeed, 1856 was probably the year he arrived, and that was a time of major wave of rebellion by enslaved people across the United States. Um, there's a second biography of Nightingale, um, that's the first biography, that can be reconstructed because he was so famous, he has, there's an obituary and then you can use the obituary to look at the census records and it's kind of like, you know, the, the records themselves are sort of a testament to the just like official devaluation of uh, the life of enslaved people and of black people, but it's like, but it's possible to reconstruct it because he was famous, a journey of, um, of, of, of an enslaved person. Um, he was uh, first, he was smuggled into Florida, where it was a common route from Guinea to, to, into, into North America, and then from Florida into the Georgia Sea Islands for a first period of enslavement, then as part of a big westward uh, transportation of enslaved people to, um, not to New Orleans, but to, um, southern, uh, to sugar plantation in Southern Louisiana, and then unusually um, traveled north as an enslaved person to Boonville, Missouri, where he spent the rest of his life. And I'm gonna talk about both of those, um, those uh, biographies because both offer insights into the Civil War and both are true in ways that are different. And I think that, well, I could go on and on about this, but I'm just gonna leave that um, there. But I think it's, it's important for me that they're both, they're both true. They're both documented by archival sources, which is all historians can ever do. Um, so the canon shot for me and the two by the existence of two biographies and the canon shot are really important to me for transnet for methods of transnational versus cis national history. Um, that Nightingale traveled by explosion by gunpowder um, is important. I'll talk more about that later, but for now, um, just to think about the instantaneousness of the explosion, both in distance and in time. Um, one thing I always wanted to do, but I haven't done it yet would be to bring a firecracker into the talk and to talk and say like, all right, so just think about the steady time of the talk, you know, sometimes it's a little, you know, slower, sometimes it's faster, but it's basically just like tick, 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 it's going on and it's over. And if I just lit the fuse of a firecracker and sat here, you would feel the time mounting and tense and tense and there'd be this huge release and there'd be a moment of instantaneousness. It would break the continuity of time. And for Nightingale, that explosion, Breaks the, I mean, it's an instant journey or, you know, 
and it's the, the, the across the Atlantic by cannon shot, and it breaks time and it breaks it breaks space too. Um, and these two things, the kind of discrete linear time and the, the the linear time and the discrete nation are just bedrocks of what we call cis national history that is history rooted in and imagined as the unitary biographies of a of, of a nation. Um, and it's something that's fundamental to the profession of history since the 19th century. So I, I love the kind of the, the impossibility of, of working with this in history and then doing it anyway. Um, and the progress of the nation is part of ideology, 19th century ideology, and part of, um, of you know, of, of, his, of, of the historical, of standard historical method too. And I think it's probably based on the model of a biography of an, of an individual who goes from childhood to adulthood to death in a single, in a single line. Um, and so just the fact that Nightingale has two biographies already messes with that, which I like. Um, but the linear time, this discrete linear time also has some very important uh, specific relevance to 19th century Atlantic history and specifically to the Civil War. Um, Generally, um, European imperialism, European nations, and white and, and the Euro European descended um, rulers of the United States imagined that you know they were free, they were equal, but only that that humanity was on a, on a scale of progress and gradually progressing, and that eventually everybody would be free and equal. But for now, everybody was in a period of tutelage, of education, of coercion, but all for freedom. And my favorite quote on this is from John Stuart Mill, because he's like the classical liberal everyone says, well, but not John Stuart Mill. Yes, et to John Stuart Mill. Um, this is from On Liberty too, so it's not some like weird, you know, I mean, not that I, anything is weird, but anyway. Despotism is a legitimate mode of government dealing with barbarians, provided the end be improvement. Of course, he'd until very recently been an employee of the East India Company when he wrote that, so he knew what he was talking about. I mean, and that was like, and it's like, that wasn't like a secret for him. That was just like, that's how white people of his class and position thought in those, in those times. Um, and it's kind of been a lot of historians have, I think, forgotten or not included that, but that's very important. Um, elite white abolitionists, which are not, you know, anti-slavery was a big movement of black and white people and, um, you know, and it was a rebellion and it was a lot of different things, but this 19th century abolitionism that, um, you know, that sways Britain and sways the United States in very important ways, um, not, you know, hashtag not all elite white, but most at least white abolitionists imagined that enslaved people, um, both because of their race and because of their condition of enslavement, were not ready for freedom yet and required a period of tutelage or education, just like this, this thing with, with, with Mill. And this linear progress justified both promised some future freedom, but said, but not now, not now. It's always about, you know, Chakrabarti has this great quote in Provincializing Europe about linear time being a way, one way of saying not yet to somebody else. And that's that's what that's what that's what this is. And of course, Martin Luther King's um, Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail has a really eloquent just refutation of that. Um, in US history, this is really important, both because this is exactly the kind of attitude of the Union Army and of the Lincoln administration towards enslaved people. Um, and also because of this weird idea that, you know, I didn't start in US history, um, but that all U US history is like the thesis, US history is essentially perfect, perfect freedom. But obviously it's not like, you know, see everything from slavery to the newspaper today, um, but it's getting there. And so everything's like a step, US history is actually not a history of freedom, but it will become a history of freedom by being more US history. So the solution of all of US history is more US history. It's very much that contributionist idea of US history. Um, the way this functions in civil war history is uh, two ways. One is that it says, well, so you're gonna point out the ways that Lincoln was a racist. Well. Nobody's perfect and it's a step in the right direction. But like, no, that's not my point. I mean, it's not a moral, it's just like, I'm sorry, that's what, you know, I'm not, whatever. But it's like this weird metaphysics that just completely misdirects the, 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 um, the, the argument. So one thing it's used rhetorically by historians today to preserve, you know, the great emancipator myth in the civil war, but like any number of things, including 
is this one of the states where they're trying to outlaw critical race theory? I mean, that's like what it's all about. Like, you can't say that because it's true. And anyway, it won't be true later, whatever. I mean, it's like, it's, but this is like, this is the way their minds worked, I guess. Um, and the other point that's more historically specific is that people will often say, well, yes, it was a very limited um, emancipation that the United States wanted to and did finally give to um, enslaved people, but it's a step in the right direction, isn't it? And what that's imagining is that this limited emancipation is the opposite of continued enslavement, which it's not continued enslavement, it's true. But if you look at it, I'm not gonna go too much into that today because I wanna focus on the conjurer, but that limited emancipation is not against continued enslavement, it's against total emancipation, other kinds of emancipation too. So it's not limited versus, limited emancipation versus no emancipation, it's limited emancipation versus whatever that means, limited emancipation versus emancipation. Um, and all of these things are made possible by this notion of a discrete nation and, this, and, a, and, a, and a linear time. So enough metaphysics for the next five minutes. Um, so now I wanna follow Guinea Sam Nightingale's life a little bit. Um, Guinea Sam Nightingale in colonial, in colonial Africa. Um, this is, you know, Guinea Sam Nightingale who was born in West Africa in Guinea around 1810. Um, and this was a period of a great shift in African history, in imperial history, um, in African diasporic history, and in world in European history and in North American, I mean, just in Atlantic history, I guess. Um, this was during the period of the wars of the French Revolution. So, you know, revolution in 1789, 1792, 1791 is the Haitian Revolution, 1792, Europe goes to war with itself and it's war until 1815. So during this period, not inspired by, as people sometimes say, at least I don't think, but occasioned by the wars of the revolution, um, unfree agricultural laborers all over the world, all over the Atlantic world, um, begin to rebel against their unfreedom. Um, the Haitian Revolution is the most famous example where enslaved people rose up. Um, it used to be you know, sort of inspired by the French Revolution, but actually, no, more like inspiring insofar as the French Revolution was, a revol you know, more the reverse, but a separate revolution, but occasioned by, um, made possible by the fact that France was at war with all of Europe. Um, other enslaved people, other, other, um, uprisings too in the Americas by enslaved people. In Central Europe and Eastern Europe, there was a form of bonded unfree agricultural labor that um, was not equivalent to the brutalities of slavery, but was also a form of unfree agricultural labor called serfdom. And it had a whole bunch of names, but let's use serfdom. And they also rose up using, again, the, 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 the occasion of the war to, to rise up. Um, and during this period, um, some elites tried to defend the old mode, preserving slavery and serf from sort of the reactionary position, while others tried to find new modes of continuing the plantation complex and, you know, the kind of agricultural production done by serfs um, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, to find, and so some tried to preserve those old modes, and some tried to find new modes of continuing both white supremacy um, in cases where that was, that was, you know, relevant in which included in some places Eastern Europe, but principally in the Americas, um, and, uh, and to find new modes of continuing the despotism of white race and property. Um, also, both in Europe and the Americas, and also then with colonialism, a new wave of colonialism expanding into Africa and elsewhere, this kind of a new plantation complex. Um, and the latter, the ones trying to reform it, were precisely the people who believed in progress, you know, educational despotism, and so forth. Um, now, Guinea was a major source of the uh, slave trade from illegal slave trade from West Africa to the United States. Um, there were US um, slavers who had, I don't know what we call, establishments both in Guinea and in um, Northern Florida. And there was just an established route. And that was probably the route that Guinea Sam Nightingale was taken, taken on. There was also just south of Guinea was, and I wanna talk about that for a second, was um, Sierra Leone, the British, the British colony, and the basis, the the, the base for the British uh, West African, the British naval fleet that was charged with interdicting, with intercepting the uh, slave trade that they had they had they had outlawed in, in 1807. And the way this worked, it's this naval law of the sea that I didn't believe this could possibly be true when I when I first read about it, but 
It is, and I, I don't want to go into too many details in it. But basically, in times of war, when the Navy is, or a private ship is, um, not anymore, but um, is, is intercepting another ship that is carrying illegal goods or contraband um, for the enemy or for any other reason, the ship, the, 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 in this case, the British, um, the British ship would capture a, a slaver and it would be declared a prize. The ship and its goods would be sold off and the proceeds divided among the capturing crew as a kind of reward. And that, that happened all through the 19th century. Um, and that was something that would happen if it was you know, military goods or whatever. But in this case, it was the slave trade. And the slaver ships that were captured were contained humans and the humans were still declared property, but they could not be sold and re-enslaved. They were declared property of the crown. The crew was actually given a, a reward for them, kind of like from the crown. Um, so it sort of preserved that system. And the crown said, they are now property of the crown, of the British government. They're not, but only for the purpose of setting them free, but linear time again, not quite yet. We had a little bit first, they need education. And besides, we deserve something for our, you know, what we did in, in, in freeing people. And so, especially during the wars of the French Revolution, but also later, um, enslaved men were offered to the Navy and to the British Army. And in the Navy, they were sent to um, the Caribbean, especially where they, in some, in some cases, fought, they fought to expand the British Empire. Um, and, or in the Army, they were put in uh, um, West African regiments where they were working to expand the British Empire there. Um, any men that weren't taken up by the military, as well as women and children, were declared apprentices not because they were going to be trained in new skills, but they were going to be declared subordinate to a master for an educational, an educational purpose. Um, and this was all part of the plan. This looked, this is something that, you know, that, that, that abolitionists thought was okay. This was like sort of, you know, a lead abolitionist thought was, was okay. The people had set it up. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was, that was, that was part of a, that was part of the system. Um, Nightingale was long gone um, by the, from West Africa by the time of the Civil War, but I want to just stay here for just a second because this, this part is very important, I think, for the Civil War. Um, it was the, the British were legal innovators in applying this contraband concept from illegal goods to enslave people, and then, but that both declared them not enslaved, declared slavery illegal, but also still declared enslaved people as seized property, but only temporarily. And um, the, in the United States, at the beginning of the Civil War, um, this then became the basis for US policy towards enslaved people. Um, the US also had a blockading squadron of the, on the West African coast for just a few years before the war. When the war began, that blockading squadron, which had obviously had experience with all of this, was recalled as part of a Union blockade of the Confederacy. So already this, 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 this naval blockading um, strategy was in, pl was, was in place, or so this knowledge was there. And the main base for the Union blockading squadron was in Fort Monroe, uh, Virginia, a big, a big port. Um, and um, the, uh, at first, at the beginning of the war, you know, Lincoln was trying to, the Union was, their official position was, we're not interfering with slavery, we're just against secession. And they would return enslaved people who came to the United States thinking they were free back to enslavers, not in Missouri, because they didn't obey the law. We'll get to that later. But but, um, but in, in places where, like in Virginia, that was, that was what they were supposed to do, and that's what the army generally did. But then in Fort Monroe, the commander there said, oh, we could just use this contraband doctrine and reclassify people who flee slavery as contraband. So they're seized property, um, and we can, you know, they'll be free eventually, but it was just like the British thing. And most historians of the US, I think, I don't think anybody's, you know, has, has, has connected it to the British to the obvious British, you know, the legal precedent, which they even wrote, anyway, I can talk about the documents later if people want, but, um, but that's clearly what was happening and that's clearly what, what happened. Um, this contraband idea became the basis for uh, union policy towards enslaved people for the first years of the war. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some at the time said, well, this is a step towards freedom, like a real step towards freedom. Most historians today see it as a step towards freedom. But a quote from one of the first people classified as contrabands um, said, and he, he was speaking out against the, the system, and he said, what we are, is, he, is the phrase he used was Uncle Sam's slaves. Um, and that's not exactly you know, technically correct, true, but you know, in some way, they were not, they were not free people. Um, and so the one thing I want to just 
say here is that kind of to conclude this section is that the kinds of emancipation that took place at least during the first years of the Civil War, and I don't want to get into the details, but I think it keeps going throughout the Civil War, but at least in the first Civil War, in front of the Civil War, were explicitly modeled on the kind of anti-slavery that was taking place on both sides of the Atlantic, that it wasn't there was a, an African side and a US side, but it was an Atlantic side. It was very similar legal, pro, legal, legal processes done by very similar white male elites who wanted to you know, not exactly have slavery, but not exactly have black freedom and not exactly give up you know, coerced, um, coerced labor through this contraband policy. And they could say that this is a step on the way, this is you know, a step on the way to some real freedom, but um, you know, and that all depends on whether you believe in time. But Guinea Sam Nightingale is you know, not in Virginia, um, the first place that Guinea Sam Nightingale is enslaved in the United States is in the Sea Islands. In the, he's enslaved in, um, I believe it's Cumberland Island in, off of Georgia, but the Sea Islands go you know, South Carolina all the way into Northern Florida. And they're, they're barrier islands. Um, they're part of the oldest still plantation complex in the United States that is still profitable by the eve of the Civil War. And they're famous both for rice and for long staple extra fine cotton. Um, and the interesting thing about the, I mean, the whole, the, the, the particular thing about the Sea Islands um, and slavery and African-American life there is that the rice explicitly, I think it's, some historians say it's because of the rice, but for whatever reason, um, certainly the, the, the rice growing technology was taken by um, enslaved Africans from, you know, the, the region of West Africa that Guinea Sam Nightingale came from, from, you know, Guinea and Sierra Leone. Um, if you know the book Black Rice, that's about this. And um, that technology was an African technology that planters were dependent on and remained dependent on. They needed this African knowledge to do it. And so because the planters were dependent on African knowledge, they, um, they the enslaved Africans, enslaved people had, you know, and it's important to say, they were still enslaved for sure. They, you know, but but they had a much greater level of cultural and economic autonomy than they had anywhere else in uh, in the United in the United States. With um, you know, establishing by the 19th century their own economic, um, you know, their own gardens, their own which and their own their own property. There's even de facto property rights, inheritance, but also a lot of cultural. They managed their own work and also you know they were again it's still enslaved, but also and also a. Uh, an ongoing um, self-consciously African um, culture and, and language. And today it's remembered as, and it's very complicated history, but as Gola in South Carolina and Sea Islands and Geechee, which is both a language and a, and a culture. Um, and that's American, but also connected to Africa. And the planters continually you know, import, imported um, newly enslaved Africans, in part for the knowledge, in part just because that's what they, they had a good smuggler, um, but they were also afraid of Africans. Um, they thought, rightly or wrongly, that Africans were more likely to rebel and they were treated brutally and sort of like tamed was the, was the word that one formerly enslaved person used to describe what happened to Africans who arrived. And that's probably what happened to Guinea Sam Nightingale. But there was also a lot of cultural autonomy and the kind of conjure the Guinea Sam Nightingale um, practiced was at first I thought, did he learn it in West Africa and bring it to the Sea Islands or learn it in the Sea Islands when he first got to the Sea Islands? Obviously, no idea. I wish I had a source, but I think that's also the wrong question because it's actually part of a single, um, just like the rice planting, it's part of a single cultural area. A lot of it's based on, um, on a secret society um, in Guinea and especially Sierra Leone called Poro. Um, some of it's based on Islam, probably too. It's, you know, it's hard to separate it all out, but it's all stuff that's in West Africa and in the Sea Islands, just like rice growing is in West Africa and, and the Sea Islands um, too. And so the conjure was part on the Sea Islands was part of a larger autonomous religion that took place in what were called praise houses that were small congregations run by, by black enslaved black clergy. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so much to say about them, but just two key things I want to talk about. In the Sea Islands, in, in Georgia um, and South Carolina, people born in Africa, that is people, not people who were descended from Africans, but people like any Sam and go were born in Africa. Many documents attest to the fact that they could fly from Africa, from the Sea Islands to Africa um, and 
go back and forth across the Atlantic as they wanted. That's, you know, maybe one of the sources of the Nightingale's cannon shot story, but it also, you know, you can decide for yourself whether it's like literal or metaphoric or whether literal or metaphor is like the right metaphor for what it is, um, is, is, um, is this, this ongoing connection to African knowledge as a source, not just like a lost past to be mourned, maybe that too, but also a source, an ongoing source of power. And the way that power was expressed was a second, a second aspect of conjure that, you know, and this is in a lot of communities, but it's, it's, you know, at least well documented for the Sea Islands, is there's a sense of an original conjurer um, who repeats again and again. And that conjurer is Moses. And that's something that people could have known, learned about, you know, oftentimes it wasn't necessarily something people learned about in the United States from whatever Christian missionaries there were, which not too many, but but it's, so it could have been in African Islam or African Christianity. Um, and the things they focus on in Moses are, you know, quite, you know, Moses was a, someone who used magic to free his people from enslavement. And, um, and they said that, and that every conjurer is a repetition of Moses. We know that Guinea Sam Nightingale later in life at least carried a twisty cane and apparently a lot of conjurers did to suggest, you know, because it's like Moses's staff that he turned into, into a snake. And, but Moses is also, in the Sea Islands, at least, seen as a repeating figure throughout history, both secular and religious, um, and that all history is a history um, where there are possible Moseses all the time appearing and reappearing. And this is, again, um, quite different from the linear time where there's one Moses, or you know, maybe if you're a Christian, you believe there'll be like a redemption later on. Here, it's like Moses is here and now in many different places all at once. Lincoln was seen as a Moses figure, both in the Sea Islands and throughout, but separate argument, but it's definitely not President Abraham Lincoln. It's like some other Lincoln. Um, Harriet Tubman was also a Moses, and she's interesting because she knew what Lincoln was up to, and she's like, she didn't exactly say, he's not a Moses, but, you know, she, what she said about, she, she recognized what Lincoln really was, and it was not a Moses. Um, and, uh, Yes, yeah, so this idea of the repeating, recurring emancipator is super important. Um, during the Civil War, um, the Union also found, the Union occupied the Sea Islands, tried to extend the contraband doctrine to the Sea Islands, um, and could not. Um, I just wanted to signal here that this is where Harriet Tubman worked during the Civil War, where she led the Combahee River Raid, um, also the source of the Combahee River Collective, well, the raid wasn't the source, but honored by the Combahee River Collective Statement, both projecting a totally different kind of emancipation than what the contraband doctrine was doing. And um, no time to talk about that, but, but I just wanted to, to signal that for, for later discussion. And that's Nightingale's first period of, of, uh, of, of enslavement. At some point in the 1840s, maybe, Nightingale moved, was, was, was sold in the internal slave trade to a sugar plantation in Louisiana. Um, and he was one of roughly a million out of the 4 million enslaved people in the United States who was forced in this, what Ira Berlin the historian calls a second middle passage. Um, this was part of the westward expansion of the United States, um, a tragedy for enslaved people who were forced to migrate um, and for indigenous people who were dispossessed too. Big part of the Civil War story. No time to talk about it now, but I just wanna, wanna signal that. Um, but the Louisiana Purchase was also part of a black Francophone culture that was part of the French empire that included Haiti. Um, Haiti wasn't part of the Louisiana Purchase and extended all the way up to St. Louis. So in the beginning, there was a black Francophone culture, you know, all through the Mississippi Valley, but also in St. Louis. And it was one that was connected to Haiti, was recognized um, also by the new US authorities and by the former French authorities as threatened because it brought knowledge from the Haitian Revolution. And also just because it was, you know, they didn't, the Haitian, they weren't the only revolutionaries, they were just the most successful one. It was also just revolutionary knowledge. And the form of conjure in um, Louisiana is often called voodoo, spelled with O-O-D-O-O, -O -O, or there's a Creole spelling for it, but it's clearly created, connected to Haitian um, voodoo. And I have so much I wanna say about it, but I'll just say very, a couple of just brief things about the kind of Haitian voodoo that that um, Nightingale would have learned about. Like the Sea Island conjure, 
Um, there's a dialectical relationship between a, a connection between Africa and the Americas. And the way they describe that is uh, spirits that are Guinea spirits, spirits are the Lua in Voodoo, um, which are the old traditional African spirits, the source of authoritative knowledge. And I think that, I mean, Guinea Sam could have been called that because he was born in Guinea, West Africa, but it also signifies that this is like, you know, a very knowledgeable, powerful conjurer. Um, but it also really thematized via the thinking about the Haitian Revolution, the Americas as a source of innovation. And um, there was a new class of spirits in first in Haiti and then and then you know and then in, in, in Haitian Voodoo um, that were named after an enslaved revolutionary named Don Pedro, who come from the Dominican Republic or from Santo Domingo, which is today the Dominican Republic. Um, taught a new dance um, to enslaved people that taught them a new drink, which was gunpowder mixed with rum, um, taught them to think about explosions as part and gunpowder gun explosions as a different kind of ritual time and space. And um, in Haitian Creole, it's called Petwo, but that's another division of spirits. And these are like the fiery revolutionary spirits. And the Haitian revolutionaries are often honored as, uh, as Petwo spirits too. No time to talk about that more. But both Guinea Sam Nightingale's um, cannon shot and also some you know, smaller evidence and kind of circumstantial evidence make me think that Guinea Sam Nightingale was, became, was another instantiation of Don Pedro in a way, in the same way that also Moses, also Don Pedro too. He was this fiery revolutionary spirit that's also super dangerous. I mean, that's that's the you know when people think about dangerous dangerous um, uh, magic, that's 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 the dangerous stuff. Dangerous, fierce, fiery, explosive, um, but also transformative. And we do indeed see this gunpowder drink appearing in the Americas. Um, in the one, there was a rebellion in 1850 led by a female conjurer um, in 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 Missouri on the Mississippi River, a little north of here. Um, where she started with coffee, the rebellion of coffee mixed with gunpowder that people drank. And Confederate soldiers also drank gunpowder mixed with whiskey before battle. And no evidence, I don't know what, I mean, all I can think is that they learned that from enslaved people. Um, so we could say that the 1850 can six cannon shot is also when Don Pedro came to the United States. And that was the year of a wave of uprisings of enslaved people um, that finally were part of this, this final push that made the Confederates so, or Southern slaveholders so paranoid that they finally seceded from the Union and started the Civil War. So I'm mindful of the time, and so I'm gonna go rather briefly, but I do wanna to get to Guinea Sam Nightingale. I wanna to get to Boonville finally, after all, after all this. Um, Guinea Sam Nightingale and Clausewitz's communists in Boonville, Missouri. In Boonville, um, Guinea Sam Nightingale became as an important conjurer, um, and he also would have encountered, um, did encounter a radical, a German population um, of immigrants from, from Germany had come in the, many have come in the 1850s, um, many of whom, and I wanna be clear that this is not an ethnic essentialism, you know, hashtag not all Germans, in fact, probably hashtag not most Germans, but there were a key like segment of Germans who had been communists in the, um, in the revolutions of 1848, that is members of the organization which Karl Marx wrote and Friedrich Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. They were also to the left of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels because at that time, Marx and Engels got better later, but Marx and Engels subscribed to the same kind of linear time of, you know, wait for capitalism to develop, don't do communism too quickly. And they said, how about we do communism right now? And, um, and they were in the military, they were, um, Enthusiasts for Karl von Clausewitz, many of them, they were too young, too, too old, yeah, too young to have fought alongside the, um, the peasantry in Prussia that they, the, the complicated story, but where Prussia tried to use peasant uprisings, but they were enthusiastic about that sort of thing. And they knew about fighting with alongside unfree agricultural laborers in, in a war. And they'd done that in 1848. And um, some of the most famous ones are um, Joseph Weidemeyer, close friend of Marx, Franz Siegel, the one who's most famous, and um, Heinrich Bornstein. These are all Missouri ones, communists who ended up in, in Missouri. And they played when Missouri, a slave state, when the governor wanted to secede, the four of the five regiments that kept Missouri in the Union were German. They were, one was commanded by Bornstein, one was commanded by Siegel. Weidemeyer was on the general staff of, uh, of, of, of um, Fremont, and these were radical German, German units. In, um, 
one section. So let's go. So there's a lot of more I can say about that. I'm glad to talk about the discussion. But in Boonville, so Boonville was the you know little Dixie. This little Dixie area was the center of slavery in Missouri. Boonville was the major city of the center of slavery in in Missouri. And um, in June of 1861, these mostly German units kind of pursued the secessionist government to Bo governor to Boonville, defeated him in Boonville, occupied Boonville, then followed him into Arkansas. Um, leaving behind a contingent of about 150 local Germans from Boonville, commanded by a, someone who's listed as a butter merchant. That's all I know about him. Um, and uh, they were surrounded in, you know, there weren't Confederate regular units, but there were a lot of Confederate, you know, irregulars. Um, and they were scared. They were in fortifications on the Boonville Fairground. And at some point, enslaved people from around the area, men, enslaved men, came into their lines, warned them of an impending Confederate attack. The German home guards gave guns to the enslaved people as they did elsewhere in Missouri too. Um, that was like not something the union allowed, but they, they just did, you know, that's like class, you know, in the, in the East, they classify someone as contraband, the union army in the West, they, not always, but they gave people pistols or rifles to defend their freedom. You know, very different kinds of politics, very different kinds of like, lateral solidarity versus top-down kind of colonial mentality. And these enslaved people were armed in uniform and they told them that this warned the Germans of this impending attack. Um, the attack happened. One of the enslaved people knew about it because it was his slaveholder who had, was leading the attack. He recognized the slaveholder, shot him in the, in the charge, the, killing, the, killing the leader, broke the charge. They weren't like super trained soldiers or whatever. And, the very badly outnumbered Germans and with their African comrades were African American comrades were um, saved the day for Boonville. They survived, and uh, they and the the um, local Boonvillers. Some letters I found complained, and they said that you know now that that this enslaved this 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 they so they would have said this slave killed his master and is protected and even celebrated for it by the Germans. Like this is making everybody who's enslaved in the area, less obedient, more rebellious and so forth. And this was a major victory. It's a small battle, but it's a major victory. It's a very different kind of war. And um, the Lincoln administration sent somebody else out who tried to, and Henry Halleck to command the area um, and who, um, who had the, these German home guards and others forcibly disarmed, tried to restore slavery. He's probably why Lucy Broadus was born into slavery rather than born, born free as she should have been. Um, it was this kind of war. If you just look at a map of where the, where the, uh, the, union, the, the union front moves, the war was won in the West. Even historians who would not agree with my account of the Civil War would just agree with the map that Virginia is a stalemate. Um, the war is won in the West and then brought East by Sherman on his march to the sea. And there's so much to say about that, but I won't. Um, and so let me just conclude. It would be reasonable to be disappointed because I said I was gonna talk about Guinea Sam and the Civil War. And like, it's not really clear where Guinea Sam, what Guinea Sam did in the Civil War. Like what was Guinea Sam's contribution? I didn't mention because I was rushing that Guinea Sam slaveholder, the physician was taken hostage by the German home guards in, in, in Boonville. So presumably Guinea Sam knew what was going on, but we don't know what Guinea Sam was doing in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the Civil War. Um, and so to conclude, what do we, so what do we think about all this? What about all these connections? It's supposed to be a, kind of my fantasy when I started this project was I would be able to show, and if I'm, you know, if I ever get to make a TV series or a movie, it's definitely gonna be like, Guinea Sam Nightingale and you know some con conglomeration of Franz Ziegel and Heinrich Bornstein will become friends and you know it'll be but you know I mean it's a little bit too much like Django Unchained that German dentist but it's not you know whatever but it's just a fantasy that's not what happened they're not there's not a lot of evidence of connection there's a lot of there's a lot of like absence of evidence of of connection I do actually have an account of a different conjurer who really worked in with the Union Army and refused to join the Union Army too um, but you know, the explosion asks us to think about disjunctures. And I thought, let's think about Lucy Broadus's um, general strike. You know, um, and I want to think about it for a second through um, 
uh, Saidiya Hartman, the, the scholar's critique, uh, African-American scholar's critique of Du Bois. In her article, The Belly of the World, which maybe some of you know, she criticizes Du Bois's concept of the general strike by saying, you know, that's really about men. It doesn't really get, it gets, it talks about labor. It talks about men. It doesn't talk about women and women's, women's general strike. And so, you know, it's a short article, but it, the sense you get is like general strike, not a useful concept um, or a limited concept. But then in this, you know, relatively recent book, which is so good, but um, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, um, Sadia Hartman says, let's we actually talk about the general strike, but not what you think of, but about women who had either were born in slavery or their, their mothers had been enslaved, um, leaving the South, going to Northern cities and carrying out what she called wayward lives and beautiful experiments, um, intimate histories of social, social upheaval, she says. So that's a general strike, just trying to live beautifully, you know, like, and to, 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 to create a life, to create a freedom with that means, not just joining the Union Army or contributing to the forward march of US history or whatever, but just living beautifully now, which is actually one of the things that the super left communists were also into also, um, is a different kind of general strike. And it's not, you know, you can say, like, what exactly part did that play in, you know, in contributing to the Union victory over the Confederacy? Like, why is that the question? What part did the Union victory over the Confederacy contribute to Wayward Lives Beautiful Experiment? Lucy Broadus, you know, very, I know very little about her, but she, I know she spent some time in New York before she came back to Boonville. And I like to imagine her as like a wayward life and a beautiful experiment. And maybe Guinea Sam Nightingale is also a wayward life and a beautiful experiment. So it's sort of an anti-conclusion, but that's where I want to stop. Thanks for listening. That was fun. I haven't done that in like two years. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kind of thrilled. <laughs> Oh yeah, should I, I don't, I should, should I, should I could read them off the chat? Is that, okay. Or if people, what's the fair way to, what's the standard? Or if you want, if you, if you that would be even better. You wanna, okay. um, can I, can so I? Do we have any yes. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah. I was, I lived in Mali, West Africa. Yeah. And I went to the Guinea part of the Mali Empire mm -hmm. at some point. And then I um, lived there for two years. And I met hundreds. They're called Nero Oh, yeah. And they still have them. And that people believe in them. And they pay them money. Like yeah. the, uh, a politician wants to win an election. Yeah. They have their own. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is so interesting. No, that totally. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's, I think that's really important to, um, to remember. I don't know the answer about the Mali, the Malian empire, but I do know that conjure and magical practice is is everywhere and it's like the idea it's always imagined as like in the past in the same way you know maybe the way voodoo practitioners talk about guinea is this section but it's it's not in the past and it's you know if you read your yeah i mean i take it really seriously too and i think when i talk to people about it i never meet anybody who doesn't take it serious i've never met anybody who's you know i mean maybe you know someone would disprove me but it's but it's like yeah it's a really part of it's interesting how there's a certain kind of and say like ritual disavowal of it, but um, you know, I think it's 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 really widespread among people of you know all races and levels of education, and it and it, yeah, it makes sense in, in this in this country too. I was I talked I met a con someone who was a herbal healer, but I mean would be called a conjurer then, um, in a, who was had been living in Boonville, was from Boonville, and left, and I got the interview on the phone. She's in Minnesota now. But talked to her about Guinea Sam Nightingale, and she actually went back to Boonville during the pandemic and started a healing center there. But unfortunately, it's I was hoping I could go visit her. That was the plan two years ago, but it's closed now. She's back in Minnesota. But yeah, it's just still like, you know, as close as. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh. I'm interested in a number of points. Um, in your presentation, you talked about that. 
Oh yeah, thank you. A number of points in your presentation, you talked about what documents tell you or don't tell you. Yeah. And there were there were moments where you could sort of place somebody on the basis of a documentary record yeah. or you know, identify somebody by their profession because the profession survives in the document. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It uh, doesn't, but but of course, like you know, the, the one thing everybody encounters and say they work and they've encountered anything is this sort of discussion of what idle silence is and what you yes. do with them. And I wonder if, if, if you care to, to just reflect for a moment or two about how you how you sort of take more steps out of the sidewalk hands and the documents. How yeah, you exactly. sort of move from the document into the archival silence. And and because that's sort of where you end it with the San Marino deal. And I yeah. that was actually a great place to end. Yeah. So, I mean, to sort of think about your unfortunate <laughs> Yeah, in yeah. So many sort of places in this project. Yeah, thank you for so much for asking that. I mean, there's a couple of answers. Like the one, like in terms of like narrative strategy, especially because you know I'm writing this for a, the the book version for a general audience. Is there's you know one of the problems that like a lot of history that excludes basically everybody but elite men always can say is like, well, there aren't enough documents and. Um, I don't want to make the dearth of documents seem like a dearth of people. Like I was talking to I throw some, some of the people in um, in a class earlier about that. But even though I don't know anything about statistics, there's this idea of sample weighting. So you know, if you only have you know a very small number of documents from this population, you know, this larger population, you don't say, well, the population is really small because the, the evidence we have from the population is small. So that's part of it. But then really in the footnotes, saying you know, like saying exactly how I, as as you do with everything, but saying exactly how I got. The, uh, the inference, you know, wh what my process of inferences is. So, and it's all like, you know, nothing's just, you know, or if I have to guess or something like that, I'm guessing this based on, and it's, you know, explain the probability. So that's sort of like the boring answer. You're not the boring answer, that's, that's, that's not boring at all, but that's important. But it's also, then it's also though, yeah, like allowing these like silences to, to speak, like, you know, I'm very, I mean, I love subaltern studies and post-colonial studies and this, you know, and then the idea of like, yeah, like we're never going to get to hear like historians, like because we're speaking history. That's not the language that Guinea Sam speaks exactly, but he speaks it a lot too. I mean, it's all about the past and the present and the future, but just in some totally different way. And so sort of trying to stage it as a, an encounter between two different ways of thinking about the world, you know, one of which is the, 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 the history that, you know, I'm trained to practice, like implicated in colonialism and liberalism and forms of emancipation that aren't really emancipation and um, the other that's like against all that and something and not just against you know not defined by its opposition but just another way of thinking about things um, another way of thinking about the same things too and I think kind of going back and forth between those two and allowing uh, the strangeness to you know that's also why I mean it's also because I I really do like don't either equally believe or equally disbelieve in history and conjure. I mean, in both of them, you know, it's like, I'm like genuinely neutral, but also even if I weren't, I would be like insistently methodologically neutral. That's what I learned in my MPhil and science studies at Cambridge, you know, it's like methodological, you know, don't take, don't take the side of the people you think were, were right. Um, and that's easy for me because I don't think, you know, the side I'm supposed to think is right was right anyway. But even if I didn't, and I think really not saying, you know, it's, it's hard, just a language thing to not saying like, well, when they say explosion by cannon shot, what they really meant is, you know, it's really a metaphor for it, but to say that's, you know, that's just translating, it's not explaining. So yeah, that's, well, thank you for that question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the really fascinating yeah. talk. Um, I, I was struck by your, your thoughts about um, different models of time mm -hmm. and historical time and the sort of alternative times mm -hmm. that, that the Congo view yeah. um, introduces and you know, thinking about that as a kind of technique or practice or you know, yeah. operation that that manipulates time in different ways. Yeah. And um that, that run in ways that run counter to this sort of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I, I was wondering, do, do, the, do you see the the radical German German actors um in the in 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 Missouri and elsewhere? In, in um, you know, North America, having different kinds of techniques for 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 
thinking about timing different ways that sort of don't adhere to the sort of muted current time that made marks. Yeah. It's, it's sort of on that. Yeah, the exactly. But are, you know, we sort of talked about this in class. Are there these other figures who are doing other things and, and have different techniques at, at their disposal for, you know, thinking about alternative um, times? I mean, I'm yeah. also thinking about, um, you know, Walter Johnson's book about King Cotton, where he talks about the, the, the steamship, right? As, yeah. as a sign of way of manipulating time, it's accelerating yeah. time. That's right. sort of speeding up the unitary yeah. time, right? But 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 the it's the, the canatron is also a kind of acceleration or it's you know making yeah instantaneous, but it's it's all it's different. It's not on, you know, as you showed, it's not on that unitary. Yeah. So yeah. Definitely. I mean, the place where it comes up that I found so far is um, a lot is in their debates with Marx and and um, Engels, both in Cologne during the Revolution and then in London um, when they're all in exile together. And um, one of the quotes I cut out is from the person who was sort of the head of the Cologne communist named Andreas Gottschalk, who calls says Marx, you know, he says Marx, you want us to wait for capitalism in order to like get your starry-eyed utopian communism and but you want us to go through like the hell of capitalism to get there like no thanks and they're just like criticizing the linear the linear time and then mark saying you need to study you're not ready yet i mean it sounds just like you know it could be like a sierra leone you know prize official in charge of you know like you know um apprentices you know saying well of course someday you'll be free but right now you know not quite not not yet um, and uh, yeah, they call him on that all the time, on time. And one thing that's really been important for me thinking about it is, um, you know, the leader, Gottschalk dies, it's not, not in an interesting way, I don't think, but, um, but the leader sort of of that faction of the left faction becomes someone named August Willich. And um, Willich was a, and Marx accused him of this, so it's probably why I know it, but, you know, or don't know it or whatever, but Willich was, was what we call today queer. I mean, it's a kind of as a trans historical concept was, you know, lived Marx set up this like Victorian apartment and um you know Victorian household and had this idea of like you know producing children and you know and legit and he was worried about legitimacy and, and all those things and it's this linear time that Lee Edelman talks about in um I forget the name of the book but you know a lot of queer theorists talk about it. it's kind of like the straight time of heterosexual reproduction and Villick lives in a barracks um with other with with other soldiers and you know drinks all day and you know, according to Marx, anyway, has has they have sex with each other, and um, it's like Willich's trying to live like a beautiful life now, and um, he's also like a wayward life and beautiful experiment too, and also a different kind of temporality there too. So that's like one way it's sort of instanti instanti instantiated too, and is really related to you know questions about, I mean, gender and sexuality, but also like straightness and queerness, even even more than that, or as much as that. So you're spot on a whole jump to yeah. because yeah. <laughs> and what's so weird is that that shouldn't be controversial. It's like right there in every public. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, right. Yeah. Right. This one is denied. Yeah. And in 1865, he was part of the, the John um Edward John here defense team. Whoa, thank you. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. And people were saying back then to surprise us. Yeah. yeah. So this doesn't surprise me. Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about Billy Sam's name, though, because yeah. it's striking. So yeah. Where did that name come from, Billy Sam Knight? Yeah. Is that a self appointed name or is that a stakeholder name? Yeah. And um, something for my for my students. Yeah. How expensive was a US illegal slave ship? Yeah. From um across the Africa. Yeah. Perfect. Great, great questions. So I know that like Lucy Broadus called him Guinea Sam and not Guinea Sam Nightingale. And you know, I know, I mean. I can imagine one reason is because Nightingale was the, the last name of his first enslaver in Georgia. 
Um, and that was, you know, fairly conventional. And it's also, so sometimes, I mean, it's really weird. Like when I think, what do I call them? Because, you know, calling, uh, you know, someone by like a, a black person by their, just their first name is sort of like, can be like a racialized form of disrespect too by when white people do it. And yet calling him by is like, that's not what Lucy Broaddus called him. I don't know what he called himself, but he was listed like in the census, you know, in the census before 1860, he was just a number on a sheet, but, but in the census after um, 18, in the 1880 census, he's the only one he's in, he's listed as Samuel Nightingale. And, um, or Sam, I can't remember what Sam or Samuel, but, um, and uh, yeah, and um, so, but Nightingale was, yeah, his, you know, what Malcolm X would have called his slave name. And that's, you know, and so that's important. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, but I know Lucy Broaddus called him, you know, and she's like my best source on him is Kenny Sam. Um, in terms of the numbers, um, we don't, you know, because it was illegal, it's like, you'll never know exactly, but there was, um, I forget where I read this. It might've been, you know, it could have been um, Michael Gomez's exchange in the country marks, but it's, it's something that I, an estimate that less than 1% of African-Americans in the United States were born in Africa uh, in 1860. Um, so a really small, really small number, but a lot of conjurers were like Sandy Jenkins, the one who worked with Frederick Douglass, um, Guinea Sam Nightingale and others were. And I think it's interesting to think about, you know, both the German communists and the African-American conjurers from Africa as these, you think like, well, from a demographic perspective, how significant is that? But, you know, I was joking earlier, like, I mean, less than 1% of African-Americans were born in Africa in the United States, but even less than that were Abraham Lincoln, there's only one, and we, we think he's important. So this is clearly, you know, and, I, and if you see them as like intellectuals and political leaders, then yeah, they're important, you know, and that's, and that's, that's why, but yeah, they're small in terms of like demog demography, you know, not so many. And then, and it could have been like, say someone in the Georgia Sea Islands, like wasn't really born in Africa, but they said they were, and they, to imitate that, to make it seem like that, they, they had a lot of sources around and they could have, you know, so there's also like a construction and reconstruction too. But yeah, it's a super interesting question, but also one that I can't answer. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it's it, no, it's so. Yeah, thank you. I thank you. Yeah. Chris. In terms of the um, the Civil War, let's say the abolition movement mm. in general, have you been able to find any sources that do talk about um, directly that do make direct links between conjurers and um, and 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 revolutionary uprisings or yes, or something that does. Um, that does talk about how the, how the or, or political action and and conjure. Yeah. Were... Yes. Two examples. And thank you for asking too, because I'm like, I wanted to, yeah. But um, so one, just like my favorite example, it's you know, is there's someone named um, William Webb who was a conjurer um, and wrote a memoir. And he wasn't in, like, in the 1870s. So it's not like, an, you know, one of the abolitionist narratives and um, in Detroit. And, uh, but he was also enslaved in Georgia and then sent to Mississippi and then to Kentucky. And he um, set up a, used Conjure to set up a, like a network of, um, he called them Kings on every plantation. And it was a communications network. And he ended up um, like, escaping slavery in Kentucky and attaching himself to, I'm blanking on his name, but he's the Union General who later went on to write the novel Ben-Hur, um, that then we just like weird coincidence, um, but, and then traveled with him and fought at, you know, if you're a Civil War buff, you'll know this, it doesn't matter, but it, really big battles with um, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. And at Fort Donaldson, which was like, that's when Ulysses S. Grant became like, you know, 
badass Ulysses S. Grant, but he didn't know it, but the, and I, I can go into the details if people want later, but the conjurer used his network to get information that made it a major union victory rather than just a, you know, inconsequential or slightly inconsequential Confederate retreat. So there I have like, you know, the smoking gun, so to speak. Um, in a lot of the US, I don't see people worrying about conjure except in Louisiana. There, people are worried about voodoo from the beginning because they know it's connected to the Haitian Revolution. And um, interestingly, the Union Army arrested in 1863, arrested a few voodoo practitioners because they said they were asking for the Confederacy to come back. And that's totally interesting because, you know, it could be that if you're a free person of color in Louisiana, you suddenly find yourself, you know, classified in the sort of semi-free status of contraband or formerly enslaved people or kind of semi-formally enslaved people under the Union Army. Whereas before, I don't know why, that's a, just a possibility. But yeah, basically they were politically threatening even to the Union occupation in, in, in that case. And William Webb, when he, you know, he like just left and then they, then when the US colored troops were formed and the recruiters came and said, don't you wanna come and serve your country? He's like, no, I already struggled for freedom. And Harriet Tubman also said similarly, you know, she'd been fighting from the beginning and when they, she was in the Sea Islands and she, you know, she even led the, the Combahee River Collective, although on her, or the Combahee River Raid, though on her own terms. But then when the Emancipation Proclamation happened and there were celebrations, she was like noticeably not celebrating. And she said, I already had my Jubilee, I don't need this one. And so, you know, it's also like, the union was also not, you know, an unproblematic thing for, for people. And there's a lot of evidence that Tubman was a conjurer. She never said she was, but she did heal with roots. And there's actually a conjurer in Canada who's kind of like set up a shrine to her. And she'd be interested. Anyway. Thank you. Okay. And there's a question online. Uh, yeah. Is it who interviewed UC Brothers in 1935 and was it a new deal writing or cultural project? Oh, thank you for asking that. It's such an interesting question. So like, yes and no. So it was this person who lived in Boonville. Um, I forget his name, but he was the head of the Works Progress Administration Writers Program in Missouri. So this is the organization that sent out collectors to collect stories. Um, you know, collect narratives from formerly enslaved people. And they're like an amazing, you know, amazing but problematic source, you know, also because of the kinds of collectors. And um, he collected at least two narratives about Guinea Sam Nightingale and never turned them over to the WPA with the rest of the stuff and kept them in his personal papers. And then this other Booneviller, um, who was just, you know, he's kind of an obvious, this, this person, I He's a kind of a local Boonville history maven. His papers then became the source for another local Boonville history maven who um, then, whose papers I looked in and found out about Guinea Sam Nightingale and found these things. So yes and no, but it's interesting that he never turned them over, but he was the one in charge of it. I mean, was this because it was so special or, you know, I don't know. Well, you, you Oh, is this was the double? This was the, the, the head of the WPA in Missouri, whose name I'm forgetting, but he was a white Boonville person who, yeah, was sort of like, like you know, one of these, these WPA interviewers where you have to read past his editorializing about how ignorant people are and things like that, you know, and he like really criticizes Lucy Broadus and you know things like that. So yeah. yeah. Um, there's something I don't want yeah. to ask for the, um, the, the, so, um, the, the, so what's the overall aim? I know Gilsam is a big part of the project. Yeah. So what's the overall aim of the, the bigger project? Yeah. It's a part of that. What are you trying to come? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like in terms of civil war history, tell a new story about the civil war, but also, you know, like to think about like blowing up US history in some ways and thinking about it like not as this, I mean, it's easy to say like, oh, US exceptionalism. I don't like US exceptionalism and I don't. I mean, but it's also US exceptionalism like swallows so many histories and like just like, like kind of distorts so many histories and kind of, it's like this like, 
like what is it like a black hole that like just everything like bends into it and disappears but to think about these histories like a phrase that i think about a lot is like histories that are in the u.s or passed through the u.s but are not of the u.s and they're not about the u.s um and uh yeah, disaggregate the United States in some ways. Maybe it's like it's almost like a secessionist thing. No, not exactly, but to disaggregate it and to to see, um, yeah, to see these revolutionary traditions that you know, I mean, maybe a little, you know, that 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 are really important, and interesting, and are sort of like hidden when they're made to be contributions or gradual steps towards an allegedly progressive um, history of the United States. Which you know, I'd be glad if it were there. I'm not like invested in like saying there's nothing progressive about the United States. Um, but I don't think that does justice to these movements. I think these movements are much more interesting. And that's true of, you know, as much true of like 20th and 21st century movements and 18th century movements as there are the 19th century movements I'm, I'm talking about, talking about too. And then also just to think about like different ways of telling history that's not all, you know, that's not kind of obliged to this, to the metaphysics of the nation state. I mean, it's less about like not getting beyond the nation state and doing like more than one nation state, although I like that, but, but it's really about getting beyond the metaphysics of the nation state at this like contained, you know, linear biographical time and thinking about different kinds of narratives or maybe different ways of writing that aren't narrative too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I really appreciate that because uh, I kind of do some of that stuff myself. Right. It comes from looking at the, the, the history of each well, it's obviously not mainstream, yeah. Um, but it was very important in in in, in how the things evolved, mm -hmm. uh, especially politically. Yeah. Because uh, even though they were kind of on the side, there were elements of what they were trying to do in what actually happened, yeah. in what becomes the sort of new the transition into something new, mm -hmm. yeah, and compromises were made, mm -hmm. whether to pacify this more extreme, more radical revolution, mm -hmm. or to make people feel like they are a, a part of this, this problem. Yeah. And if we don't tell these stories, we will realize that this, this, these, these histories, they still live with us. Yes. Even though they are on the side. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm applauding you back for your discussion. Thank you. And for listening. Thank you so much.